Hey everyone, Daniel here from Next Level Life, and welcome to part two of our look at Robert Greene's book, Mastery. In part one, we talked about how to find your calling, and if you missed that video, there's a link to it in the description below, or you can click on the card in the upper right-hand corner of this video and get yourself caught up. So you might ask yourself, once you've found your calling, what is the next step on the path to mastery? Well, you've got to start an apprenticeship in order to learn the tricks of the trade, so to speak, of whatever career path you've chosen. And that's the question we're going to explore in this video. How do you find that ideal apprenticeship, and what exactly should you be doing during it? Let's get started. In the stories of the great masters throughout history, you can identify a specific phase in their life where all the skills that would make them household names were being developed. This part of their lives is often a very self-directed apprenticeship that usually lasts about five to 10 years, but it rarely receives that much attention because this part of the master's life doesn't actually contain any great discoveries or achievements. But we're gonna change that today because without the ideal apprenticeship, our chances of finding mastery in our own lives are slim to none. And there's one principle to keep in mind while going through the apprenticeship phase. The goal isn't to accumulate money. It isn't to get a good position, title, or even a diploma. The goal is to transform your mind and your character. When we first enter the working world, most of us are still a little bit socially naive. We're unprepared for the political games that people sometimes play. Our heads are full of dreams and fantasies about the future, but this naivete is exposed in the light of the real world. And we're naive at this point in our lives because our knowledge of how the world works is based on our own emotions, insecurities, and very limited experiences. And to succeed, we need to ground ourselves in reality and transform ourselves from someone who is somewhat impatient and scatterbrained into someone who is disciplined and focused. Which means that we should choose the job that offers us the most opportunity for gaining practical knowledge and objective feedback from others. And once we've made that transformation into a more disciplined and focused person, we can begin the three-step process of the ideal apprenticeship. The first step is deep observation. And this is where you will observe, without any preconceptions, two essential realities of the world you've just entered. The first are the rules and procedures that govern success in whatever workplace you're working in. And some of these things will be told to you directly, and you'll know it when you hear phrases like, this is just how we do things here. But others, such as unwritten rules or what the company objectively values in its employees, may not be explicitly stated to you. I'm going to use a professional basketball player as an example. During this phase of the apprenticeship, the basketball player would be watching games on TV. He'd be closely studying what the most successful players do, and not just the fundamental things like their dribbling moves or shooting motion, but also things like their body language when dealing with teammates and opponents, and how they use things like trash talk to get under the skin of their opponents. And in a business setting, you can find the answers to those unwritten rules by watching who is on their way up the corporate ladder and who isn't, since those people who are moving up are more than likely the ones that are following the unwritten rules and showing the behaviors that the company actually values. And be sure to take your time with this step because it'll help you navigate your way up the corporate ladder faster and avoid costly mistakes. The second step is the skills acquisition phase of the apprenticeship. This is where you're putting in those 10,000 hours that everyone talks about. Let's go back to the professional basketball player from step one. He's observed everything from how to shoot the basketball to how to deal with opponents and get a competitive advantage. And this is where he's going to start putting all that he's learned into practice. Now keep in mind, at this point in the process, you don't want to critique yourself. You just want to focus on every part of the process and get as many reps in as you can. The goal here for you is the same as the goal for our basketball player. You want to develop a kind of muscle memory for each part of your job. And in the beginning, focusing this intensely is going to take up all your mental energy. But what's exciting is that eventually you enter what's known as a cycle of accelerated returns, where the process of whatever task you're working on has become hardwired into your brain enough that the practice starts to seem a lot easier. You enter a state of mind that psychologists refer to as flow, where you don't really have to think about what you do because it comes to you almost automatically. For our basketball player, this would be when he's developed that muscle memory when dribbling or shooting enough that he can stop thinking about it and start focusing on how to best attack the defender based on whatever the defender happens to be doing at the time. And once you've got to this point, you can start the third step of the apprenticeship, which is the experimentation phase. This is where you begin to critique yourself as you practice. You try new things to see how you can make the process better for yourself and actively seek out constructive criticism from others. Our basketball player might start to try and fake out the defender instead of just trying to blow by him on the drive. He'll be talking to coaches and other players to try and figure out what he needs to improve on as well as get new ideas of what to try out. So in summary, you find the ideal apprenticeship by searching all the opportunities in the field you've chosen and choosing the one that gives you the best opportunities to learn and develop the skills you'll need for success, even if it means that you don't get paid as much. And once you get there, remember to keep an open mind. Keep expanding your horizons and don't let your ego get too big. And trust that the process will get you where you need to go. Mastering a skill is like chopping down a huge tree. 
You won't take it down with one swing of your axe, or three or four swings for that matter, but if you keep chopping away at it, eventually, whether it wants to or not, the tree will fall down. So that'll do it for part two, and you might be asking yourself at this point, hey, how can that be it? We're talking about the ideal apprenticeship, and I didn't even mention finding a good mentor once. Well, you're right, and the mentorship aspect of the ideal apprenticeship is exactly what we're going to talk about in part three. Unfortunately, I have my final exams coming next week, so I don't think I'll actually be able to get part three out by next week, but I do have a summary of Martha Stout's book, The Sociopath Next Door, that I'm almost done making. So what I think I'll do is I'll upload that summary next week and then come back for part three of Mastery the following week. So until then, if you liked what you saw here, be sure to subscribe. Thanks for watching, and have a great day.